Father. Speak, O oh Lord. That's what we want. Lord. That's what we need. We need You to speak. Lord, please don't leave me to my own power and my own abilities. Lord, but if You will speak, if You will speak through Your Word, if You will be pleased to speak through me, a jar of clay, Lord, and use this vessel, Lord, what can happen this morning, Lord? You can do great and mighty things, wonderful things, Lord. Oh, Lord, You can open the eyes of the blind as we read about Bartimaeus. Oh, God. Truly, You can do the impossible as we read about this morning. Man is impossible with God. All things are possible. And so we stand with an expectation that all things are possible and You will do the impossible things, Lord. Saving sinners. It's impossible with the help of man, but Lord, You can change hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. You can open blinded eyes. You can call dead men out of the grave like You did Lazarus. Lord, You can encourage Your church. You can strengthen the brethren. Father, would You show us Christ? Truly help as only You can. Spirit of God, come fall upon us, please. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you can turn to Titus chapter 1. <clears throat> Titus 1, starting with verse 1. I'm going to read 1 through 3. Titus 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. For the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which God accords with godliness, uh, with accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, that the proper time manifested in His Word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. I want to talk to you this morning about the God who never lies. There we see it in verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. You don't have to know much about this world to know that our world is filled with liars. Right? Men lie all the time. They promise things and they don't deliver. They say they'll do something, but they don't. I've heard very, very sad stories about children who grew up with a father who said that they would come and pick them up on the weekend, and they didn't come. I've heard stories about women who were promised things by this man who said that they loved them, and in reality, they were lying. Right now, we are seeing all this stuff about elections, and all these politicians are promising all manner of things. And once they get into the White House, we found out they're lying to us. Men lie. Men lie. We don't even have to look at outside we know within our own lives, within our own families, within our own relationships, we know that people lie, why? To a, appear a certain way. People lie because they want to look a certain way. Certain people lie because they want to cover things. They don't want to be exposed. They have a fear of being exposed, and so they lie. They lie and say who they are when the reality is there's someone else. Men lie to manipulate people, man manipulate things to get their way. Men lie all the time, but we here see that we have a God who never lies. That's something to think about. An encouragement and a terrifying reality. Think about this, the reality of this. I mean, here we're holding Bibles, 66 books filled with truth, filled with words that God said. And in every single case, everything that God said is true. Everything that God said that is going to happen is going to happen. This is a coin. 
And you know that there are two sides to a coin. On one side, this is a great encouragement to every Christian. Every, every Christian, think of this. There are promises, there are truths in God's Word, and they are completely and totally true. That's an encouragement. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the encouragement for the believer that God never lies. But then we're going to flip the coin and we're going to look at the other side. For the unbeliever, God never lies. And there are many things in God's Word that are said that are targeted towards the unbeliever. And this is terrifying and frightening. And we're going to look at both of these. So first, the great encouragement for believers. So, we know that the Scripture is filled with promises, filled with truths. And there's no way that we can look at all of them this morning. But I, I prayed and I pray that the Lord has helped me to pull out some that will be a help to you. First off, you think of this. The reality that if you're here, you're a Christian. That means that God has saved you. I mean, John 3.16. You can turn there or you can just listen. John 3.16, what does it say? For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. That's true. I mean, yeah, we see it on bumper stickers, we see it on t-shirts, and yeah, John 3.16. This is true. God never lies. There is an eternal life that if you are a Christian in this room, you have. You have eternal life. Listen, there's a reality that you will not perish. On the day of judgment, and when all around you there is perishing, you will not perish. We see it here. Whoever believes in Him should not perish. This means, brethren, that you have an eternal life. And how did you get it? You got it by believing. You didn't have to work for it. You didn't have to strive for it. You didn't have to pay for it. You got it by believing. And it's an eternal life. It's not going to end. That means that no matter what, when all of eternity is set before you, you know that this is not going to run out. Oh, there are so many things in this life that run out. You, you know, sometimes uh, me and Zeke the other day, we were talking about uh, income tax and you get this wonderful income tax check it is great and you're like oh income tax but well, what happens it runs out people get inheritances and they get these inheritances and they're great but what happens they run out you get a full tank of gas and what happens it runs out you load up a, a shopping cart full of groceries and you're like oh we got food but guess what it runs out but eternal life will never end it's forever that is true and you have this no one can take it away from you brethren if you're saved you have an eternal life. And you got it by believing. What about Ephesians 2, verse 8? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You have been given grace and faith. It says that this is a gift of God. God has given you grace. He's given you faith. And you've been saved by this. Not by your works. Oh, think of what it would be if salvation was by works. To know that God only accepts perfection. What a hopeless endeavor it would be. What a discouraging thing it would be. Oh, you would try and try, but you know at the end of the day it would be hopeless. It would be fruitless. But you have an assurance, brethren, that you have been saved. By grace, not by anything that you've done, but because of the love of God, because of the kindness of God. He's given this to you. You have not earned this, but He has given it as a gift. Everything that you need to be saved, He's given. And there's no boasting here. What about Romans 4 8? The reality of this Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. That's taken from the psalm. Blessed is the man whose sins are what? Forgiven. Brethren, if you are in this room and you are a Christian, you have been forgiven. You know, sometimes it's good for us to go back to the fundamental, elementary principles of our faith. Because sometimes we cease to be in awe of the awesome. Think for this with me for a moment. Go back through the catalog of your days before you became a Christian. And all your shame 
and all your sin, all the things that would cause you to hang your head, all the things that would cause you to lie, to appear a certain way before God saved you because you didn't want people to know that you really did these shameful things, things that your parents still don't know that you did because you're ashamed and you don't want anyone to know about these things. But the reality is this, that if you're in this room and you have trusted in Christ, you have been forgiven. All of your sins have been forgiven. They're gone. Do you know what it's like to have odds against somebody? Do you know what it's like to be in conflict with somebody? Isn't the thing that you desire most, especially when it's your fault, don't you desire to be forgiven? Don't you desire for them to look at you and say, I forgive you? And to know that it's real, not just that, yeah, I forgive you, but stay over there. But know that forgiveness that is welcoming that forgiveness that is embracing, that forgiveness that says, I know what you did, but I will not count it against you. Our relationship will not depend upon what you did. I am removing that and we are coming back together. That's the reality of what we have in Christ. We've been forgiven of our sins. God has forgiven us. Brethren, this is true. Our God never lies. But sometimes you don't feel forgiven. Right? Sometimes you sin and you don't feel Forgiven. But our God never lies. Regardless of how you feel, it's not based upon feeling, it's based upon truth. As we sang, I will stand on your promises. We've been forgiven. Ephesians 1 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Do you realize? That the forgiveness of your sins is based upon the riches of His grace. You know, the reality is, I could want to do a lot of things for you all. Maybe I could want to take you all out to eat after this. But that's going to be according to the riches of my bank account. (laughs) There's going to be a limitation there. There's going to be a hindrance. Oh, but the riches of the grace of Christ, the riches of the grace of our Father, the riches of the grace of the Holy Trinity, our forgiveness is based upon that. And every single sin has been forgiven for the believer. We have been redeemed. You know what that means? It means to be bought back. We were slaves on the auction block. No one wanted us. You know, maybe you've seen these movies about slavery and you have these big, strong, strapping slaves and people start auctioning off. I want him. No, I want him. I want him. No, I want him. And everyone starts looking there. But then there's this weak, paralyzed, feeble, diseased slave on the auction block. Who wants that one? Nobody. They can't even give him away. Our God came to the auction block, saw us paralyzed, covered in sores, filthy, leprous, dead, and said, I want that one. I will buy that one. Oh, he bought us. And what did he buy us with? His blood. God gave his son so that we could be saved. And he was willing and he did it by the shedding of his own blood. And he said, I will buy them with my blood and I will forgive them of all of their sins. Brethren, you're in this room no matter what you've done. No matter how many times you've done it, if you are a Christian, you are forgiven and you can stand before the Father unashamed and unafraid, not because of any good of you, but because you have been redeemed by the blood of His Son. You have been bought according to the riches of His grace. You've been forgiven. What a thing. What about this? Romans 5, 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. Oh, oh, we say that. I say that. Don't we merely grasp at what we're talking about when we say this? We say hell. We say wrath. We say anger. We say fury. We say judgment. We say punishment. These are words we're grasping to really get what we're talking about. We're talking about the all-powerful and mighty God being furiously angry with sinners and pouring out His judgment upon them forever. And brethren, this was aimed at you. We had this. 
pointed at us. I mean, we know about snipers and they have that red dot. And it's aimed at their target, finger on the trigger, ready to pull it. We had the red dot of God's wrath upon us and He was ready to pull that trigger. But what happened? Christ stepped in between us and that judgment and He took that wrath for us. Christ suffered the wrath of God. This cup that was filled with all of God's fury. Oh, this cup that was filled with all of the anger of Almighty God. Again, what are we talking about? We try, Lord, please give us a revelation of what you saved us from. This wrath was in that cup and Christ said, I will drink it. I will drink it down to the dregs. You know, sometimes you drink and then you, you think it's all gone and then you put the cup back and it has that little film of drink that kill comes back down and you say, oh, there's more in there. Oh, no. No, Christ, He licked the bottom of the cup. Not a single drop of wrath was left for the children of God. He drank it all. Brethren, we've been saved from the wrath of God. You have been saved from God's furious anger. No matter what this world throws at you, no matter how bad it gets, look, you can be somewhere, you can be in Iraq being tortured by ISIS, and as bad as it gets, you have been saved from the wrath of God. You can have every member of your family taken from you, and it could cause great suffering and tears, but at the end of the day, you've been saved from the wrath of God. You can be struck with the most painful disease this world has ever Ever known, And at the end of the day, when your eyes close and you open them on the other side of eternity, you have been saved from the wrath of God. Why are you downcast, oh my soul? What can get you down when that's a reality? You've been saved from the wrath of God. What about this, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4? Verse 7. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon Him? Think of that. There's no one. There is no God. Our God is the only God. And He is near to us when we call upon Him. I know that it's true. That you can be in a room full of people and feel alone. I know that it's true that you can talk to a hundred people. You can read messages on Facebook and have text messages. And, and it can be your birthday. And it can be a celebration. And be surrounded by people and hear all manner of words. And completely feel alone. You can feel like, feel like nobody is close to you. You can feel like nobody is near to you. You can grow up in a family that has 24 children and feel like the loner. But God is near to us. Whenever we call to Him, He's near. He's not far off. Listen, our God, who, you know what it says of, of, of the Lord? It says that the heavens and the highest heavens cannot contain Him galaxies, black holes, planets, stars that make our sun look like a pebble. We're talking about a massive and expansive galaxy upon galaxies. And it says that that can't even contain him. He's huge. He is massive. He's majestic. He is glorious. He is powerful. And he's near to you. He's concerned about you you when you have a headache the Lord who's holding all things together by the word of his power hears you and says wait a minute one of mine needs me what a thing that's amazing who else would do that you call kings you call presidents you call dictators and emperors are they going to stop everything and come to you our God is near to us when he when we call upon him 
Whenever we call, look, it can be the darkness. It can be the most intense trial of your life. And you call upon him, he's near. But what does it feel like? Sometimes it feels like, where is God? Where is he? I, I, I feel like I'm talking to the ceiling. I feel like my prayers are just bouncing off the roof. I don't feel him. Is he still near? Our God who never lies. He is near to you when you call upon him. Or it can be the most wonderful day of your life. He's not just there on bad days. He's there on good days too. He's there in the middle. Whether it's early. Sometimes, you know what? You get a phone call and you're like, it's too late. Uh, I'll call you tomorrow. You get a text message and you're like, did they really text me at this time? Oh, uh, that's inappropriate. Uh, I'll talk to them another day. But our Lord, you can call, you can call on, on Him at 4 a.m. or 4 p.m. You can call on Him at any time of the day, any time of the year. He doesn't take holidays off. You can call upon Him at any time and He's near. It's not just that he hears you and says, okay, I heard you. But he's near. Isn't there something about someone being near to you? Isn't there something about someone being close to you? To feel that touch, to know that the presence is close. What a thing. Deuteronomy 4, 29. <clears throat> we get more encouragement, more promise, more truth. It says, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. If you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul, when you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. We have a better covenant, and our God does not leave us nor forsake us. But you see where it says that He, what? If you search for Him with your whole heart, you'll find Him. If you search after Him with all your soul. I'm not sure how familiar you are with false religions. I mean, right now, the Pope is in America. and People are just making the biggest deal about this. You go in these different parts of the world and you see the Hindus. What do they do? They wear this. They dye this. They travel this far on their knees. They walk on a bed of, of nails. They'll lay on a, a bed of coals. They'll, they'll sacrifice animals. They'll offer their children. They do all these things. They'll bathe in this river. As, as a Muslim growing up, the thing is, okay, well, go to Hajj. People try to do all these manner of things. And they, at the end of the day, they're no closer to their God than they were when they started. It's almost like looking at the prophets of Baal on, Mark, on, on Mount Carmel. They cry out all day, start cutting themselves and doing all this stuff, and no one answers. They're searching, but there's no one to find. They seek, but there's nothing there. They come to the end of the rainbow, and there's nothing there. But we have a God, when you search after Him, He doesn't hide Himself. He says, you will find Him. He's there. He's calling you to Him. Come to me. Come closer. You're not close enough. Have you ever heard in Scripture where it says, you are the apple of His eye? You, you know that, that that word apple is actually like a mistranslation. It's supposed to be, you are the little maiden of the eye. Do you know what this means? It means that when you're looking at someone, and you're looking in their eye, and the closer you get, you can see yourself in their eyeball. That's how close our God wants us to be to Him. That when we look in His eye, we can see. He says, you are the little maiden of my eye. You're, 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 you're my precious bride, and that's how close I want you to be to me. Not way over there, but Lord, I feel dirty. Not way over there. You come close and closer. You're not close enough. I want to see myself in your eye. I want you to see yourself in my eye. That's how close He's calling us to Him. He says, search after Him with all your hearts. You will find Him. You will find Him. Not might, not maybe, not most of the time, but you will. You will. Psalm 50, 15. We already touched on this at the Sunday school briefly. Psalm 50, 15. Great promise, great promise. And call upon me in the day of trouble, 
I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. He's telling us, this is how it's going to go. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. That's a guarantee. Brother, sister, you come upon the day of temptation. That's the day of trouble. You come upon the day of suffering. That's the day of trouble. You come upon the day of tribulation, the day of persecution, whatever your day of trouble. It doesn't tell us what the day of trouble is. It just says, call upon me in the day of trouble. And what's going to happen? I will deliver you and you will glorify me. He's inviting us. Call on me. Call on me. What about the reality that he loves you? Let's, let's look at his love for us for a moment. Do you ever doubt that he loves you? Do you ever struggle? Are you tempted with ideas that he doesn't really love me right now because of the hardship that I'm going through? I mean, yeah, I'm a Christian, but cancer? I mean, how many funerals do I have to go to this year? God, it's, it's, it seems like I'm unloved. Or maybe because of the falls that you've been having. Maybe you've been struggling. <clears throat> Brethren, think on the promises with me and be convinced of His love for His people. What does it say in John 15, verse 9? This should knock us out of our seats. And I know it doesn't. But it should. Listen to this. This is Christ talking to His people. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Ah, as the Father has loved me, take that first. Just as the Father has loved me, the Father loves Christ. What level of love are we talking about? What kind of love does the Father have for the Son? Okay, whatever you have in your mind, that's too low. It's greater than that. The love that the Father has for the Son is greater than anything that we can even begin to fathom. We're talking about the Trinity loving one another. We're talking about the Godhead. We're talking about the Father loving Christ, perfect Christ, beautiful Christ, worshipped Christ, lovely, altogether lovely, perfect Son of God. And the Father loves Him. And with that same love, not that kind of love, not similar, that same love, with the same love. That's how Christ loves His people. Do you, do, do, do you feel that way? Maybe not, but it's true. We see it in Titus, our God who never lies, never. This is not an exception to the rule. He loves you with that same love. This is why Ephesians tells us that we need to pray for spiritual strength to comprehend the height and depth of love that he has because we don't get it. We're not talking about the love of a parent for a child. Oh, that's good love. We're not talking about the love of a husband for a wife. That's good love. We're, we're talking about an eternal love. We're talking about a supernatural love. We're talking about a holy and perfect and divine love. Is there any level higher? Can you think of a level higher than the love that the Father has for the Son? In other words, He loves you with the greatest level of love that there is to give. There is nothing higher. He's given you His best. He's given you His all. This is an amazing thing. And when you think about who you are, when you think about what you've done, when you think about the things, when you think about how you've treated Him, how have you neglected Him 
even as a Christian, have you truly loved him with the love that he deserves to be loved? Have you worshipped him with the worship that he demands? Have you truly been appreciative of the gospel and all that it entails? Have you truly walked in a manner that's worthy of the gospel every day of your life? You know you haven't, and neither have I, but his love hasn't changed. His love for you is the same that it is for his son. It's amazing. Every Christian has this promise. Are you the weakest Christian in the history of Christianity? You might be. But you know what? He still loves you with that same love. No matter how much of a bruised reed you are, no matter how much of a smoldering wick you might be, he loves you with the same love. This is true of every believer, and we have it on God's word that he is the God who never lies. He doesn't merely tolerate the Christian. He doesn't merely put up with the children of God. Sometimes we have family gatherings, and we only see that one family member one time a year, and we know. We're like, oh, I'm going to see uncle so-and-so. Oh, I'm going to see cousin so-and-so. And you got to love them because they're your family, but you don't really enjoy their company. You just got to kind of put up with their talk and, okay, when is this over? Our God does not treat us that way. He does not love us like that. He doesn't tolerate us. He doesn't put up with us. He loves us. He has an affection for us. The scripture says that he takes delight in the one that fears him. We are his pleasure. We are the apple, the maiden of his eye. We are his joy. He loves us. Amazing. This is how the Lord sees you, Christian. You. But what about this? Romans 8, 38. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You may say, yes, I know that He loves me. But I feel like I'm under spiritual attack and I feel like these demons will separate me from that love. Ah, but what does his word say? Neither angels nor rulers nor demons. You may say, ah, yes, he, he loves me today. But what if tomorrow? What if I sin tomorrow? What if I fall next year? What does the word say? Things present or things to come. Well, perhaps... What is upon this list? Maybe that's the thing that would not separate me, but I can think of some other things. What does Paul end it with? Nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You may say, well, well okay. Maybe He just loves me because I've been walking well. My prayer life is the best it's ever been. My time in the Word is the sweetest it's ever been. I just feel like I just have victory like I've never had. This is why he loves me so much. Ah, but what do we know? But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us while we hated him. He loved us while we spit in his face, while we mocked him, while we loved our sin, while we only went to him when we wanted something. That's when Christ died. If he did that for us while we were yet sinners. Now that we are his children, how, how does he look at us? Do you think it's less? Do you think that he loves you more while you're a sinner than you are than you're a believer now? Rather, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench. Do you know what this means? You know what a bruised reed is? It's like. You know, we don't see these kinds of plants so much here, but you, you, you think of a, a stalk of, of wheat, and you look at that thing, and it's broken. But it's not completely broken off, it's just kind of hanging. And you would look at that thing and say, it's easily breakable. The Lord looks at that and says, there are some of mine who are like that, and I won't break them. I won't crush them. You look at a candle, right? And the candle's going out. It's coming down into the wax and it's barely there. It's kind of smoking. 
There's a little bit there, not much, just a little, little light. The Lord says, I won't, I won't quench it. What will he do? He will restore that broken one so that it can stand upright. He will look at that smoldering wick, that smoldering flax, and he will pour more, more, more oil and so that the flame will glow brighter. How encouraging. Look, if you feel weak and feeble after the first message, I hope you do feel weak because you are. Those who feel so weak and they have no strength to hold on, he will not break that bruised reed. He will work with you. He will cultivate the flame so that it will grow. You think of anything else that might frighten you, brethren, Listen to this last one. Isaiah 41.10. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What causes you to fear? Falling away? Stumbling? Putting Christ to shame? Enemies? Torture? Persecution? Famine? Nakedness? Death? Danger? Sword? All the day long we are like sheep regarded to be slaughtered. What causes you to be afraid? What is it? What are we told? Fear not. Why? Why can I not be afraid? For I am with you. No matter what comes against you, the Lord is with you. No matter what. Singleness, the Lord is with you. Infertility, the Lord is with you. Miscarriages, the Lord is with you. Dead children, the Lord is with you. Fear not. I am with you. Be not Dismay. Oh, how many things in this world could cause us to be dismayed? That would tempt us to be dismayed. You lose your job. You lose a family member. Things don't go the way that you had hoped. You had a dream for your life. And now you look at your life and you're like, I'm this age. This is not where I thought I would be. There's so much room to be dismayed. But what does the Lord say? Be not dismayed. Why? For I am your God. I am your God. You don't deserve a God like me. You don't deserve me to be with you, but I am with you, and I am your God. Oh, help. You feel weak? He says he will strengthen you. You feel helpless? He says he will help you. You feel like you're about to fall? He says, I will uphold you. Not by your hand but with my righteous right hand. Rather, no matter what, if you are a Christian, He is with you. He is for you. He loves you. He has saved you. He has rescued you. He has forgiven you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He has put His fear in your hearts. He has removed the heart of stone. He's put in the heart of flesh. He walks with you. He smiles upon you. He will discipline you. He will not allow you to go out. You're in His hand and who can snatch from His Father's hand? You're eternally secure. You have His Spirit. And He will keep you until the day. There are many more, many, many more, but for the sake of time, let's turn the coin. And I want to talk about the terrifying warnings for unbelievers. Micah 5.15 Just as encouraging as it is to look at all the promises for believers, I think it is equally terrifying to look at the danger for unbelievers. Micah 5.15 says, And I will execute vengeance and anger and wrath on the nations, on the nations which have not obeyed. Here's the question. Have you obeyed? Are you amongst the nations that have not obeyed? You know the reality of this. If you are not a Christian, you have disobeyed Him every single day of your 
life. You have disobeyed him in various ways. I don't even need to name ways. You can think of them yourself, but I will name a few. You have not loved him. You have loved worthless idols. You have worshipped things and yourself instead of him. And what does he say to those who have not obeyed? Again, remember this. Christians, we have the righteousness of Christ. And Christ obeyed everything. So we have his obedience. But what's going to happen to those who do not have the righteousness of Christ, who do not have the obedience of Christ? You are seen as one who has not obeyed. And this is what God says. I will execute vengeance in anger and wrath. That's what's coming for you. This is more sure than the seat that you sit in, than the air that you breathe. This is more sure than the clothes that are upon your back. He will execute vengeance upon you if you are not in Christ. But what of this? Nahum 1.6 Who can stand in the presence of his rage? Who can oppose his burning anger? He pours out his rage like fire and smashes the rocky cliffs. If you fall off of a cliff, you are smashed. He smashes the stuff that would smash You, who can stand in the presence of his rage, you will stand before him. It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You will stand before him. And this is not... This is not something to play around with. Who can oppose his burning anger? What are you going to do? Are you going to try to talk yourself out of it? He knows everything. He sees you. He sees through to your heart. He sees through to your very soul. He knows everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done, everything you've wanted to do. You're naked and exposed before him, and it is coming for you soon, and you don't know when. When you stand before him, oh, my friend, how will you oppose his burning anger? What are you going to do? How are you going to block yourself? How will you protect yourself from the burning anger of Almighty God? He pours out his rage. Our God has a rage. And he will pour it out. And it will be poured upon some in this room. Unless you repent. What about Zephaniah 1.15? A day of wrath is that day. A day of trouble and distress. A day of destruction and desolation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's wrath. And all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy, for he will make a complete end, indeed, a terrifying one of all the inhabitants of the earth. We are citizens of heaven. We have a citizenship not of this earth. There are inhabitants of this earth. You are of this world. You are worldly. You love this world. You go in the ways of this world. And there is coming a day, a day of wrath, a day of trouble, a day of distress, a day of destruction, a day of desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. You got money. Your money will not help you. You have charm. Your charm will not help you. You have looks. Your looks will not help you. You have a you have a history of helping people and doing good. None of that will help. There is a day that is coming and you will stand before him and it's coming very soon and here's the danger you don't know when in San Antonio I was asked a friend of mine his uh, he told me his father went to the doctor and was told that he had leukemia said he had four weeks Just like that, four weeks. He said, would you please talk to him about his soul? And when he dies, will you do his funeral? I said, I got four weeks. I'm going to use this time wisely. When I went to see him, turns out two weeks had already passed. So he only had two weeks. All right. I spent time with him. I talked to him. It kind of seemed like he wanted to think about it. I said, all right. Well, I got two weeks. I'm going to go every day. Every day I'm going to spend time with him. Well, you know what happened. He died that Friday. Two weeks. He didn't get two weeks. Instantly he was in the presence of God. He thought he had more time to think. He thought he had more time to process. He thought he had more time. When I went to see him, he was laying on his deathbed watching a movie. 
I said, sir, you're about to stand before Almighty God. Don't you realize this? We think we know. We think we have time. But the reality is you don't know when. I'm not trying to give you a scare tactic. You know, there are some people who say, if you eat McDonald's every day of your life, you'll have a heart attack. Well, that's not true. Some people can eat McDonald's and not have a heart attack. Some people say, if you smoke every day of your life, you're going to get lung cancer. Some people smoked every day of their life. They didn't get lung cancer. I'm not giving you some some statistic. I'm telling you what is going to happen. Our God never lies. This day is coming. And if you are not His... This is going to be a day of darkness for you. What does it say in Romans 2.28? But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. That outlines every man and woman and child who is not a Christian. Your life is about you. It's about yourself. Everything you do is about yourself. Even the good that you do is for yourself. You're selfishly ambitious. You do not obey the truth. What is the truth? The truth is that you are a sinner and God is holy. The truth is that you have offended a holy and righteous God and you deserve wrath. But he's provided a way of escape in Christ. He's given his son. He's poured out his wrath on his son. And he's given you this as a gift. Run to Christ for safety. And you slap Christ in the face and say, no. You don't obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. You obey your lusts. You obey your instincts. You obey your animal passions. There will be wrath and fury. There will be. Two plus two equals four, and it always will. And those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Jeremiah 21, 5. This is terrifying. The Lord says this, and I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. When I was growing up, I was terrified of Mike Tyson. I would watch this man fight, and I say, I would not want to be hit by Mike Tyson. I was scared. The Lord says, I myself will fight against you. And this is a reason to tremble. Isaiah 13, 9 says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel, with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and He will exterminate its sinners from it. The day of the Lord is coming, It's coming. Like we look at the time and we say, okay, it's this time. We know that 3 o'clock is coming. Nobody questions if 3 o'clock is coming. It's just assumed. We know it's coming. Okay, the sun is going to rise. The sun is going to set. December is coming. Christmas is coming. The storm is coming. We see the cloud. We know this. It's coming. But more sure than any of this, because none of that could happen, the Lord could say it's done now. And none of those things that we're so sure about could come. But this is is coming the day of the lord is truly approaching and it's approaching and it's approaching to give us time to repent we're told it's coming psalm 37 38 but all sinners will be destroyed the future of the wicked will be cut off are you a sinner have you not Come to Christ? Are you in here and still in your sin? Then the Lord says you will be destroyed. He says he will fight against you. He says that the day is coming and it's cruel and it's with fury and it's with burning anger. He will exterminate its sinners from it. I used to do pest control. We would, we would go into a place and we would look for the creatures to exterminate them. We wouldn't see a roach and say, we'll let him live. We wouldn't see where mice were and say, nah, that's not a big deal. It didn't matter if it was a fly or if it was a possum. We went in there to exterminate. The Lord is coming, and He's coming to take His people to to joy and pleasure and eternal life and to exterminate those who do not know Him. You can doubt me. You can say, I don't believe you. But our God never lies. Revelation 20, 15 
And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Is it there? If your name is not written in the book of life, but I go to church, is it written in the book of life? But I sing the hymns, is it written in the book of life? But I listen to Paul Washer, and, 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 I, and, I, and I come to this church, and I read my Bible, is it written in the book of life? If it's not, you will be thrown into the lake of fire. God does not lie. It's coming. Will you go back to your sin? Will you turn away from this offer of mercy? Look, Jesus Christ is merciful today. He offers salvation today. He offers His hand today. The Lord says, All day long I have held up my hand to a stubborn and stiff-necked people. How long will you hold out your hand to somebody before you put it away and say they don't want to come? How long will you continue to offer an invitation and they don't RSVP? How long will you continue to say, do you want to eat? You know, I was telling my daughter one day, I said, Grace, when mommy makes dinner, she puts all the plates on the table. And then she says, it's time to eat. What does she expect everyone to do? She expects everyone to come to the table. But what happens if you don't come? Well, she might call again. Grace, I said, it's time to eat. What happens if you don't come? She might call again. Grace, it's time to eat. What happens if you don't come? Y'all will start eating without me. The Lord is calling people to His marriage feast. He's calling people to the wedding supper of the Lamb. He's saying, come. He's saying, come into the gate. The door is closing. He's saying, the, the storms are coming. Come into the ark. There's a day that is coming when that door will be closed. There's a day that's coming when the table will be set and we start eating and we say it's over. There's a day that's coming when the invitations will no longer be sent. It's too late for you to RSVP. It's too late for you to call and say, hey, did I miss it? It's over. You don't want to miss the time. In Psalm 7, it says, If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. I don't know if you've ever done archery, if you've ever held a bow and pulled back the string, and you have the arrow ready to fire. You can be strong, and you can hold it, but you can only hold it for so long. And then your hand starts to tremble because... I need to let this go. The Lord has His bow aimed at you. An arrow aimed at you. And He's been holding it for years. There's coming a point when He's going to say, that's it. But what do you have as a promise? All this terrifying, scary truth. There's still a promise that remains for you. Romans 10, 13, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, even you, even now. What does Christ say? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Christ took the wrath of God so you would not have to. He took all the horror and darkness of that day so you could have the day of light and joy. He obeyed so that you could have His righteousness. He suffered so that you would be forgiven. He shed His blood so that you could be redeemed. And He offers you this free gift, not according to works. Come. But you cannot come with sin in your hand unless you're coming to offer it to Him and say, cleanse me. If you come with sin thinking you can hold on to it and keep it, there is no salvation for you. He calls you now. Come to Him now. Are you tired of working and trying and failing? He came for the weak. Look, if you're weak, if you're tired, if you're heavy laden, if you're burdened, He came for you. And He calls you to Himself. If you're sick, if you see that you are sinful and dirty, 
and dead. He came to cleanse you with His holy blood. One more illustration. You know, sometimes when your phone rings, you don't hear it. And you realize you had a missed call. Sometimes it's on silent. Sometimes it's vibrating. Sometimes you have things in your hand and your phone is in your pocket and you're trying to put your things down quickly so that you can get to it. The Lord is calling you today. Well, you missed the call. Well, you missed the call because you didn't hear it. Why didn't you hear it? Well, because you silenced it. Because you wanted to enjoy your sin. You're silencing your conscience as He calls to you. Will you look later and say, I missed the call? Will you stand before Him on the day of judgment and say, but, but I didn't have a chance? He says, you are a liar. I called you that Sunday and you missed the call because you put me on silent. Will you miss the call because you have so many things in your hand and you're trying to enjoy them and you're like, well, I still have time because you know how it works. The phone will ring and ring and ring and it has a certain number of rings before you miss it. And you may say, well, I think I got a few rings left. You're trying to get these things in your hand and you realize it's too late. Will you miss the call of the Lord because of the things in your hands? This is dangerous. <coughs> Respond and know that His promises will come to pass. Everybody in here will see that His promises are true. Everybody in here will see that God never lies. Everybody here. You will see that He never lies. The question is, how will you see? Will you see that He never lies about His joyous promises for those who love Him? Or will you find out that He never lies about His swift anger and fury for those who don't? There's no reason for you to not have his joy if he offers it to you. You will be one of the two. Which one will you be? Father, thank you that you never lie. Thank you that we have a faithful and trustworthy God and that we can go to your word and see that every single thing that you say is completely true and it will come to pass. And thank you, Lord, for saving us that we can rejoice in your promises. Oh, but Lord, I pray that you would truly open up the eyes to the terror that awaits those who are in their sin and that they would flee from that day and run into your arms. For you are good and kind and merciful, ready and willing to forgive and save. Please, Father, do what only you can do. Show them their sin. In Jesus' name, amen.